when you get started on PERS today, PERS, I'm sure you've noticed, is difficult to read. It's pretty dense. It's like heavy-duty philosophy stuff that, that, that he does. But hopefully, <coughs> through the lectures, I'll, I'll be able to make things clear to you what he's doing. Because he really is actually extending upon what we've done before, especially on the material from Herder. So <coughs> let's just start with a little bit about Peirce. He is an American. He's the only, I mean, one of the older philosophers. He's, he's, he's an American philosopher. I would say he's, some people consider him really the greatest American philosopher. And some people, and, and in fact, people consider him really one of the great philosophers ever. He was born in 1839. He <coughs> went to Harvard, uh, graduated. 1862. He had some difficulties in his career, so he never really got a, a regular kind of academic post. He worked for a long time with the United States Coast Survey, or it was later called the United States Coast and Geodesic Survey, and he spent a lot of his time doing measurements, and particularly with pendulums, where he was trying to determine variations in the Earth's gravity in different places on the Earth using a pendulum. Don't ask me how he did this, but that was the kind of work that he did. Uh, very sort of minute scientific types of work. He did uh, have an academic position for a while at Johns Hopkins University. He, he had that for about five years. It was a non-tenured position as a lecturer. He lost that position, though, you know, there's, he had these, for some reason, he, he developed these strange enemies who didn't want him to get a job. And so there was one guy at Harvard who just hated him and so prevented him from getting a job there. And then at Johns Hopkins, somehow one of his enemies, well, he, uh, it's a little complicated, but he, he was married. Then he separated from his wife. It took a long time to get the divorce. In the meantime, he sort of, st he started a relationship with a second woman. And so, while he was at, this was at, while he was at Johns Hopkins, and so somebody had spread this rumor about him sort of living in sin, and so he lost a job because of that. So he <coughs> ended up then uh, moving to, he, he bought, he, he had this small inheritance, he bought this farm in Milford, Pennsylvania, and moved there. He didn't turn out to be a very good farmer, and so he really lived in in poverty, really, for the rest of his life. He really lived kind of a, that the last part of his life was really difficult, and, and so he, he died in poverty in 1914 in, uh, in Milford, Pennsylvania. He did receive s some help from some of his friends, particularly William James, during this time, but all during his career, all during his life, he kept publishing different essays and articles uh, about philosophy, about science, about a, a large range of topics, and these essays, they were really, the, the, he, he wrote really like thousands of different essays on different topics. And so it took a long time for people to really recognize the importance of his work and begin sort of uh, excavating all of this work. Uh, and, and so uh, he's best known for a, a series of different essays that appeared in different journals. And the essay that you read for today on a new list of categories is considered one of his key essays for understanding his work and really for him I think it was it was really cons he considered it to be a breakthrough essay. So um, to understand exactly what he's trying to do we want to uh, we're going we're to just go through this essay just section by section so it's, it's split up into these 15 different sections so we're going to start with section one and section one actually is should be familiar to us he says, this paper is based upon the theory already established that the function of conceptions is to reduce the manifold of, sens of sensuous impressions to unity. That's the first claim that he's picking up from, from before. And that the validity of a conception consists in the impossibility of reducing the content of consciousness to unity without the introduction of it, uh, with this, uh, without the introduction of the conception. So he's saying that <coughs> we, you know, we have this multiplicity of impressions that we're faced with and in order then to reduce this multiplicity to some kind of unity we need a conception and we can't do this reduction without a conception 
And this should be familiar to you because it's basically the argument that Hadder made before as well. If you recall, he talked about the main problem of human perception being that we have all these things that we could be looking at and we don't have any instinctual method of determining what's important, what's not important, what to pay attention to. And essentially he's saying that, that distinction, the, the distinguishing mark is what aids us in reducing this multiplicity of impressions to a unity, to, to something that we can focus on. And so this is basically the same thing that Peirce is saying here, is that we need a, well he calls, he doesn't call it a distinguishing mark, he calls it a conception. He says we need a conception that would reduce the multiplicity to a unity. That we, we get, we've got so much, so many impressions, there's no way to decide what to focus on or, or really even what, you know, what is what. And we need a conception to reduce it to a unity and we can't do it without a conception. Right? There, there has to be something uh, that's not just impression that would allow us to then be able to perceive the impressions. Okay? So that's the first step he makes. Right? It's, it's <coughs> it, 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 he says it's something that he's established elsewhere, but it's also something that we've seen established elsewhere by Hader. Okay? So that's the first step. That this is his project, is trying to, f to understand this process of reducing multiplicity to unity through the conception. <coughs> his next claim, and I, you know, um, I, I up somehow the, the original set of PowerPoint slides I uploaded, they were, they were in the wrong order, so I, I uploaded them again just a few minutes ago. So if you, if you uploaded them earlier, you should, you should get the revised deck. Okay, so section two, he says that there are these gradations in the universal conception. He says this theory gives rise to a conception of gradation among those conceptions which are universal. He so he's, he's actually adjusting Herder's conception now. So Herder said there's a distinguishing mark, and that's the thing that, that reduces the multiplicity to a unity. But then he's saying that there's gradations. It's not just the g distinguishing mark. It's not just the conception. There are gradations in conceptions. And the reason he says is, for one such conception may unite the manifold of sense, and yet another may be required to unite the conception and the manifold to which it is applied, and so on. So it's, it's a little bit confusing. What he's saying here is that you need one conception is that, would do, that would reduce everything to unity. So there's a conception that, that unifies everything. And then he said another conception might be necessary to link that first conception, which is unity, to the, to the manifold. So it's a little strange. He's saying that one distinguishing mark might not be enough, or, or, or rather that, that that distinguishing mark might itself have different pieces to it. Right? He's trying to say, well, what, what, are the, what is the structure of this conception that links up the multiplicity to the unity? And he's saying it might not be just a simple structure. It's not, might just be, it's not something, you know, Hedder says it's the distinguishing mark, and Peirce is saying it, this distinguishing mark might have an internal structure to it that has different pieces. So that you have one conception that creates the unity and then another conception that links that first conception to, to the multiplicity. It's, it's a kind of a strange idea at this point. But basically this is the content of his essays. He's, he's trying to work out what is this thing that links the multiplicity to the unity and what's the structure of that thing. Or, or things, or whatever, yeah, he's, and he's, he's trying to, to, th to think through basically the structure of the distinguishing mark, the structure of a sign, right? So that's, that's basically what I want you to, to hold on to, that he's thinking through what the structure of the sign is, and he's saying that it, it's composed of these, these con conceptions. Okay, so this is just a diagram trying to, just trying to illustrate this point that you know, on this side we've got really what Hader is doing. He's got the manifold, all of the different Spence impressions that we have, and then the unity, and the distinguishing mark is what reduces the multiplicity to the unity. Right? And Peirce is proposing that this distinguishing mark has a structure in which you've got <coughs> really these pieces of the distinguishing mark that 
create the linkage between the manifold and the unity. And so he's, he's, his one conception is required to reduce the manifold to unity, and then another conception might be necessary to link this first conception to the manifold, right? So <coughs> that's how he's kind of imagining that there's this, there's this structure to the distinguishing model, right? <coughs>